evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to the live program number 116 at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Professor Jory Carter from the United Kingdom. Professor Carter is an accomplished knee surgeon, researcher, academic, educationalist, humanitarian, and previously a specialist surgeon for the International Committee of the Red Cross. After completing orthopedic training in Scotland and knee fellowship in Sydney, Australia, and Newcastle in 2005, he was invited to accept consultant trauma and orthopedic surgeon post at Gateshead and to become a team doctor for Newcastle United Football Club. He's been a consultant orthopedic surgeon with special interest in complex knee surgery at Southwest London Electro Orthopedic Center in Ipsum since 2015. He's also a visiting professor in the Faculty of Health and Life Sciences in Northumbria University. In the past 13 years, he has developed an extensive interest in research and postgraduate training and published more than 100 scientific papers, book chapters, and articles. He's the editor in chief of two journals and the associate editor of many prestigious national and international journals. He's a member of the Royal College of Surgeons of England, Quality Assessment Panel, and Appointments Advisory Committee. He's also the vice president of the BOSTA, which is the British Orthopedic Sports Trauma and Arthroscopic Association and also an examiner for the fellowship exam. Since 2010, he has been dedicated a significant amount of his time for humanitarian work with the NGMB Medical Charity and the International Committee of the Red Cross. Today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Professor Jari Kader for a fantastic lecture on orthobiologic therapies in the knee. Over to you, Prof. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. So good morning, afternoon, and evening to whoever is listening. Today's lecture is uh, going to be about uh, PRP, stem cell, and hyaluronic acid. So as uh, it is said, I work in Epsom, uh, Swaliok. I'm a knee surgeon. I just do elective surgery there. And I'm a chairman of NGMV charity and with Paul Banaskovich, we've published a few books related to um, the uh, postgraduate education. And I am also um, still a war surgeon. I worked for ICRC and I work for other charities. And I work um, as a visiting professor in Northumbria University. So these are the bioactive and anabolic molecules. Today, we are going to be talking about some of them, not all of them. So we will focus, as I said, on visco supplement, PRP, and cell-based therapy. This topic is not entirely new, as the Greek always do. They have um, something uh, written about this in their uh, mythology. So they, this uh, Prometheus, who is the champion of uh, humankind had his liver eaten by an eagle and regenerate every day to be eaten again the next day. Apparently he stole fire from the gods uh, to give it to humankind. Our body has innate uh, regeneration uh, capacity. Every second, three million RVCs are uh, uh, expired and replaced. We also have in our tendons uh, stem cells or progenitor cells that can regenerate the tendon. That is particularly related to my practice as a soft tissue knee surgeon. This paper shows that uh, the uh, hamstring tendon after harvesting it regenerates in 70% of the patients. You all probably know about um, uh, the uh, hoo-ha about uh, uh, stem cells and PRPs. Uh, they uh, claim to treat uh, everything nowadays with stem cells and uh, PRP from um, hair loss, to diabetes, to MS, to any other neurological condition. And the idea is that stem cells have the power to go wherever uh, necessary in the body and regenerate and rebuild the area. 
There are about uh, 70 uh, rogue clinics in the UK. Most of them are in London and most of them are in Harley Street. The idea is that they want to harness your body's healing power by injecting stem cells, which you will know subsequently they are not even stem cells. So testimonies like this encourages people to go to those clinics. Uh, they get told that the stem cell injection gave me my life back. So a lot of people who have problems, such as the 10 million people who have arthritis of the uh, knee, they will be very happy to take an alternative route and go to Harley Street and have an injection which is supposed to be curing them. So you can see one, with one injection of stem cell, you can walk better, then walk faster and eventually start running. Even our meetings, our scientific meetings, show us many products which claim to be biological treatment for uh, uh, various conditions of the joints. And this paper shows that 65% of them are not uh, peer reviewed, especially in the big meetings such as ANA and uh, AOSSM. Some of these treatments have been proven to be dangerous. Some people have been blinded by the stem cell injection or paralyzed by spine injections. And there has been multiple programs and uh, uh, people have been prosecuted, not necessarily just orthopedic surgeons, but various clinicians are uh, uh, practicing this, especially in America. And some of uh, these, they are not even qualified doctors Having said that, there has been some uh, uh, revelations and uh, also some benefits to stem cell therapy in this case where somebody was blinded for many years and had the benefit of stem cell uh, regeneration. Some clinics in London, uh, they uh, claim that they can uh, heal meniscal tear, any sports injuries, uh, patellofemoral problems, and any um, tendon problems with uh, uh, stem cell injection or PRPs. We also have clinics that offer lipogym and uh, tell people to discover the power of fat. Believe it or not, uh, George Bush has um, something to do with the science and com commercialization of adult uh, MSCs. Uh, so he banned uh, uh, supporting the um, embryonic stem cells, but that has created uh, uh, massive publicity for stem cells. In, in a way, it has affected stem cells uh, in a bad way because uh, the perception is that all uh, uh, MSCs are embryonic ones, or all stem cells are embryonic. You will see later in the talk that's not the case. So going back to uh, today's focus, so we'll start with hyaluronic acid injections. You are all familiar with um, probably thousands of products of hyaluronic acid. Multiple companies are participating in the production of hyaluronic acid injection. I'm going to start from the end and just tell you the summary of this. So to summarize the whole thing, which I'm going to take you through the evidence, but I'm going to tell you that there is a massive confusion in this topic. Hyaluronic acids are not all the same. Some of them are better than the other. It's impossible for any scientist to be able to reach any conclusion with the available evidence. But to make things, make things simpler for you, uh, it is useful to um, utilize uh, hyaluronic acid in early arthritis they do have some efficacy for two to three months in early arthritis. 
they become less effective as the um, degree of degeneration progresses. Now I'm going to take you through some literature and I haven't just picked uh, whichever suits my opinion. I have picked those that have uh, had uh, a mostly systematic reviews and meta-analysis of high uh, quality studies. There aren't many of those, but I'll try my best to get you, I've tried my best to get you the, the available evidence. So the Cochrane uh, Library, that was um, from 2006, you, it, you might say this is uh, a long time ago, showed that um, although it, the Visco supplement shows some effectiveness, because the effect size was not significant, therefore they were not confident in using hyaluronic acid for uh, arthritis. This is a meta-analysis of many RCTs, 54 RCTs, showed that hyaluronic acid for knee osteoarthritis is effective for about four weeks and reached its peak for um, uh, at about eight weeks. This is another uh, meta-analysis two, from 2012, again, including many uh, trials and large number of patients, which shows that uh, this is, it is not effective or it's very, have a very small clinically irrelevant benefit. And this is another meta-analysis from 2013. They have uh, saline as a, a control. This, um, a meta-analysis showed that it is safe and efficacious. And if you see this one from 2015, it is from France, and they looked at only the high quality trials of intra-articular hyaluronic acid injection and compared them to placebo, and they found that it is, has a moderate benefit. This was from Chicago. Uh, from Brian Cole's uh, group, uh, the conclusion was um, uh, it's, uh, hyaluronic acid is a viable option. I leave that to you to uh, make whatever you want to make of it. From China, this uh, paper in 2015 uh, showed that um, it is effective um, and has no adverse effect. NICE uh, do not recommend hyaluronic uh, acid injection. So is Osteoarthritis Research Society International. Neither of them recommend hyaluronic acid injection. The American Academy is very much against it, or they were. I don't know. I, I looked to find out if they have a new statement, but that's the only one I could find. It appears that hyaluronic acid is not the same thing. So those um, components who have a higher molecule, molecular weight of more than three uh, million Dalton uh, are more effective than the one who are uh, lesser, have a lesser molecular weight. So to summarize again, it is essentially very confusing topic, the majority of the guidelines did not find sufficient evidence to recommend for or against hyaluronic acid in osteoarthritis. But as a general rule of thumb, if you have to use it, which I do sometimes too, uh, it is more effective in people who have early arthritis. And remember, it is effective for about two to three months better than steroid probably for, you know, by a couple of months. Now we move to uh, PRP. And um, again, PRP uh, uh, has been uh, uh, used for various things from muscle pain to tendon problems to again, hair loss. And of course, for uh, uh, cosmetic purposes and a lot of uh, American think that if it is good for Kobe, then it must be good for the uh, rest of the population. Of 
course, those uh, uh, platelet-rich plasma, they, they get uh, soft spin and hard spin. Some of them have RBCs, some of them don't. In addition to uh, the platelets, the, you know, there are other factors, but the platelets themselves um, contain calcium, potassium, uh, protein factors, the growth factors, and prostaglandins, all will be part of the package. There are some uh, uh, large number of proteins in there, 1,100 proteins, and there are some good stuff, which are the, you know, the, the, the growth factors, and there are some uh, not so good materials in the uh, combination of PRP. PRPs can be, uh, of course, as I said, either have a low density fibers or high density fibers with or without leukocytes. The leukocyte rich PRPs cause a significant increase in the uh, inflammatory mediators, understandably. So let me take you through some studies uh, that have uh, used PRPs. Again, I've picked the systematic reviews of level one and two evidence. So uh, this one has um, chosen multiple uh, good studies. So uh, the outcome of this was um, uh, it may be beneficial, but with a small effect size. Sorry, I'm just, need to, yeah. So, and this one is another RCT shows that the PROMs are better with PRP uh, as opposed to hyaluronic acid. And this was published in uh, uh, American Journal of Sports Medicine 2017. This study from Finland, which is more recent than the others, shows that the intraarticular injection of PRP associated with better outcome than hyaluronic acid in knee arthritis. This meta-analysis of 10 RCTs published in 2018 didn't show um, any significant benefit uh, from uh, the uh, PRP injections. How about uh, PRP in patella tendinopathy? I found uh, three control studies and nine case series. Uh, comparing the PRP injection with dry needling, shock waves, and uh, physiotherapy. Some studies were for and some were against, but generally the studies which were well conducted, they didn't show any uh, benefit. Similarly here, there are multiple studies. Uh, this is a slide uh, from uh, uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, so he, this shows that there are multiple studies related to PRP and cartilage, but uh, again, there are no high level studies that showing any benefit from injecting PRP for uh, traumatic injuries of the cartilage in the knee. The problem is we don't know what PRP do to the cartilage. Does it do, does it work as an anti-inflammatory? Is it immunomodulator? Does it repair the cartilage? Or does it delay the degradation of the cartilage? And does it, or does it do something to the synovium that helps the arthritis overall? There is a big problem with uh, PRP injections because there are at least 40 commercial uh, platelet separation systems. The, the, there's massive variation. It's very difficult for us to conclude anything from those studies because they are not comparable. They, even th within the same system, if you take the PRP at a different time of the day, you will have a different yield. And the quality of harvest is different from uh, uh, by using different systems. Currently, there is a massive amount of money being uh, 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 invested 
or uh, the commercial value of PRP is uh, over 130 million just in the US. So, and the PRPs, some of them have white cell count and varying degrees of um, uh, growth factors. So therefore, we, we, it's very difficult to um, recommend any system and difficult to conclude anything from any of those studies because they are not similar. Now we go to cell-based therapy, and this is the final topic. And here we are, um, I'm going to take you through stem cell and mesenchymal stem cells, which is called stem cells, and uh, show the benefit of this in, in knee conditions, including, of course, uh, uh, arthritis, uh, uh, ACL, uh, meniscus, and patellofemoral problems. So let me start by defining stem cells. There, there is a massive confusion around this topic, believe it or not. And the more, new, the more you know about it, the more confused uh, it can get. So the, the National Institutes of uh, Health defines stem cell as those cells who are capable of dividing and renewing, so rejuvenating cells. And they are unspecialized, but they can differentiate and they can specialize subsequently. And those uh, cells have a niche. So the niche is subset of cells that almost like the physical anchor of those stem cells that can maintain them and control their reproduction. Stem cells have different types. So probably you all heard about the embryonic stem cells, which are the true pluripotent cells. When you say pluripotent, that means it can give rise to the uh, embryonic uh, germ cells, which is the mesoderm, endoderm, and ectoderm. Then you have the tissue specific stem cells. They are the somatic and the adult stem cells, and they are completely different from the embryonic ones. They are multipotent, they are not pluripotent. So they can, multipotent mean they can multiply to a specialized cell, but not to every type of cells. And then these are very difficult to find and culture comparing to the uh, embryonic ones. And then there is this induced pluripotent uh, stem cells. This is very interesting and I'll tell you more about it later. These are the, you know, you can genetically program adult cells to make them embryonic stem cells. And then you have outside that group of stem cells, you have mesenchymal stem cell, and they are also called stromal cells, but they are not stem cells, and I'm going to tell you why. So this is really very important. So essentially you have to, Sorry, I just need to remove this, yeah. Uh, so uh, it's important for us to know what is adult stem cells, which most of us uh, have uh, uh, been hearing about. And most of the people who are claiming that they are injecting stem cells, I think it would be from this category. But the truth is they are very rare to exist. They are very difficult to identify, isolate, and purify. So they are found in tissues that develop from all three layers, right? They could be anywhere in the body, yes, but they are rare and they are difficult to identify. They are, as I said earlier, they are not pluripotent. They are multipotent cells. And they proliferate inside the body, but not in a culture, right? And that is very, very important. And they have some limited plasticity. Plasticity, that means they differentiate into tissue other than their uh, origin. Sorry, just... I said earlier, I will talk about the induced pluripotent stem cells and um, this uh, doctor uh, 
uh, Shania from uh, Japan has won a Nobel Prize for this. He managed to uh, convert mouse adult fibroblasts to uh, fibroblast to pluripotent stem cell, which is one of the major discoveries in recent years. Dr. Kaplan is well known in this in this field. He is the same person who described MSC many, many years ago um, in the 80s. And he called them mesenchymal stem cells at that time. And they had different other names, colony forming unit, marrow stromer cells, and, uh, and they ended up with uh, MSC as we hear about it today. So the misconception was the you put MSC into the knee and for miraculously, this will start proliferating and differentiating to the exact tissue that we want. So if we have a chondral defect, this MSC will uh, immediately become cartilage. The problem is we are, um, we are not sure what dose of MSC will lead to any proliferation and differentiation? And do these cells survive in a hypoxic environment? These cells have a, they have a very high metabolism. They are going into low nutrition environment with low oxygen. Do they survive there? Do they have the right signal to make the cells that we want? And how can we make them proliferate and differentiate. We all have seen this many, for many years uh, because this has been out, you know, even when I was in medical school. So we, this whole uh, regenerate, regenerative medicine and tissue engineering, it's all a hypothesis and all can happen in vitro, not in vivo. Dr. Kaplan has uh, stated uh, in recent years that he was wrong and he can take back the name that he gave um, to the MSCs and he want to call them something else now, which is medicinal signaling cells instead of mesenchymal stem cells. Because MSCs, are different from stem cells. They, yes, they can differentiate into osteoblasts, chondroblasts, fibroblasts in vitro, and they have the characteristic to adhere to plastic, and they have certain CD markers and don't have others. So Dr. Kaplan, he, he says that it is permissible for a person who named them to change his mind and call them something else. And the reason he called them medicinal signaling cell is that it was emotional to him to uh, completely uh, change the MSC for something else. In recent years, it has been uh, uh, discovered that the all MSCs are parasites. What that means that you have MSCs, so that is now it is medicinal signaling cells everywhere in the body, unlike stem cells, they exist everywhere, wherever there is a blood vessel and they are called parasites. So these parasites live around the blood vessel. When there is a stimulus, there is a trauma, there are some growth, local growth factor, or change in the microenvironment, these will be activated. And when they get activated, they will have a few effects. One of them is trophic effect, immunomodulatory effect, and antimicrobial effect. So then when the environment settles, they go back and reestablish themselves on the blood vessels. So when there is an injury to, the, uh, to those parasites, what happened, they will start producing some uh, uh, T cells, B cells, and change the immune uh, system locally. 
and maybe systemically, and then they would have trophic effect and uh, of course antimicrobial, anti-scarring. So how, how do they work? How do MSCs work? So that's how they work. So they might be just after they get activated and released to the environment, they might recruit local stem cells to regenerate uh, uh, that area. They, of course, secrete some uh, trophic factors, mitogenic, angiogenic, anti-apoptotic, and scar-reducing substance, and then secrete some cytokines, growth factors, and then have some immunomodulatory effect through the T and the B lymphocyte. And then also there's some modulation, not disease modifying, but pain modulation and anti-inflammatory effect. We have to remember that mesenchymal stem cells um, decline with age. So the older you get, the less likely people will find those cells in your body. I have to thank uh, Nardine Pippin and um, my co-authors. We are uh, doing a systematic review on this topic. These are some of the uh, tables from our uh, work. Uh, we're looking at here at the, uh, the effect of stem cell on ACL tear. Some of these are people who have had an injury, but majority of those are related to people who have had surgery and subsequently uh, have an, uh, an additional injection to see if it is of benefit. Here you can see the uh, traffic light. So the reds are no response or a negative outcome. The green are a positive outcome, but some of the, uh, this group's work um, are, um, have been a bit discredited because um, most of the uh, papers are uh, case series and low quality studies. So essentially, if you want to uh, conclude anything from this, it shows that the good studies don't show any effect of stem cell on ACL healing or repair, while the lesser quality studies so show a positive effect. Similarly here with meniscal tear, some studies claiming that uh, when you inject um, uh, MSCs, um, whether it is from fat or from bone, the, the meniscus regenerate, but then the, the way they have measured uh, the volume of the meniscus is a bit difficult to understand or quantify 15% increase in the volume of a meniscus could be inter-observer error or difficulty in even assessing, quantifying uh, MRI changes uh, in that magnitude. How about tendinopathy? Again, small studies, small numbers have shown there is some benefit in tendinopathy, in patella tendinopathy. But would I use it? I don't think uh, we are ready for that. Still high volume injection probably is a better uh, uh, treatment for patella tendinopathy. Now we're looking at arthritis um, and uh, again, level four evidence. It's a case series showing that injecting uh, MSCs have led to significant improvement in the cartilage. And you can see those photographs from their paper. It's almost unbelievable. This uh, RCT is showing uh, there's no difference in pain relief between BMAC and normal saline injection for uh, uh, knee arthritis. This paper is again by the same group, Centino et al from 2008 showed that the injection of uh, stem cells or they called stem cells or MSCs are uh, causing a significant uh, cartilage growth and improvement. 
this is a, a, an important study uh, looking at six trials of um, with the high risk of bias uh, showed uh, level three and level four evidence in favor of stem cell injection. So essentially discrediting those trials because they have a bias in them, although they have shown a positive effect, they, they were not of uh, sufficient quality to be taken into consideration. Now looking at uh, um, MSCs uh, in cartilage uh, lesions, in 2014, there was this uh, systematic review. Uh, there were 15 animal studies at that time and um, 14 clinical one, mostly case series of small numbers. Subsequently, this has improved. Many RCTs um, were uh, reported in 2017. Um, but then in recent years, this year, there has been this uh, review of stem cell. Uh, they found that there are um, 40 registered uh, trials in clinical trials uh, uh, at uh, USA. So there are a lot of studies currently happening, but the result of the other, the, the previous studies which have been done, they are not of sufficient quality to uh, conclude that um, uh, stem cells are, or MSCs are uh, uh, good enough to use in clinical practice. The problem has been highlighted in this work by Ian Murray and uh, from uh, Scotland. It says here that the, essentially the, there, is, there, there is no standardized protocol how these uh, uh, preparations are made. What is the composition of those uh, injections that are given? So none of the existing studies have a standard protocol for harvesting the, those um, materials. This is a, a, a nice study from Chicago by uh, Brian Cole uh, and his team, which showed that a normal cell line is effective for six months. Um, Now, I have to remind you the importance of uh, placebo in medicine. I think we orthopedic surgeons probably have been uh, uh, in a way um, uh, forgetful of the effect of placebo because we use less uh, medicine and uh, we have more surgical intervention. The, this study shows that 50% of the effect of that particular medicine was placebo. They have divided them into multiple groups and it was one of the very well conducted studies. But you have to be mindful that anything we do have a massive placebo effect, even probably our surgery. I'm not saying that uh, uh, all the previous biological um, material I've mentioned our snake oil and shouldn't be used. But I think we need to understand what is the cellular and molecular mechanism of stem cells, right? And what are we trying to achieve? Are we stimulating the local cells to start working? Are we working on inflammation, on degeneration? Are we trying to uh, remodel the matrix? Are we working just on pain? And we still don't know what is the composition of this cell therapy. And we also don't know what makes that actual uh, injection work. We don't know how to signal to them in the new environment to produce and achieve what we want them to achieve in the target organ. We have, uh, uh, well, we are about to st start this uh, study. And essentially we, we, what we're trying to do, we're trying to find out what is actually in the solution that's given. We want to harvest fat from the abdomen, 
from the hip and then trying to count the cells and use the transcriptomics to and uh, flow cytometry to find out what type of cells are in these uh, injections. And hopefully this will be a platform that we can do some clinical study from. So in summary, there is too much hope, but little evidence so far. And I have emphasized, I think the point that MSCs are not stem cells. The MSCs are the conductor, conductors of their microenvironment. The problem is there is no standardized way to uh, report the composition, the storage, the dosage, the packaging, and the delivery uh, of those um, materials. And we still don't understand the molecular basis of these and we don't know how to signal them and direct them the right way. I think. Circulating microvesicles are small membrane enclosed structures that are released into the extracellular space by a variety of cell types, including endothelial cells, epithelial cells, platelets, and additionally, tumor cells. Circulating microvesicles vary widely in size, from tiny vesicles, often referred to as exosomes, that are typically only 30 to 100 nanometers in diameter, to larger structures that can be up to 1.5 micrometers across. Exosomes are generated through invagination of the cellular membrane and then released through exocytosis. Cells can also shed for. So I was uh, just going to uh, give you a flavor of uh, some technology which may be very helpful in the future. So we may be able to package those um, uh, exosomes, um, which are these microvesicles that um, it is like a cell-to-cell -cell signaling, especially the way that uh, stem cells communicate. Hopefully at some uh, point, we will be able to uh, package those uh, vesicles with whatever regenerative product we want to send to the cell and then um, have a better targeted effect. This is, uh, thank you very much for listening to me. We have this uh, very interesting course at the um, beginning of the year next year, if all goes well. It's a cadaveric course on everything you need to know about uh, uh, knee, uh, soft tissue, surgery, and it's all very much hands-on. Very few uh, talks, but the majority of it is spent two days in the lab to learn all the things that we do in soft tissue knee surgery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jari, for that fantastic lecture. You've thrown a lot of insight into a very commonly discussed problem. Actually, it is not a solution, rather, because of the raw clinics that you mentioned. And uh, I'll read out some of the questions that have come up in the chat box to begin with. Yeah. There's a question by one Mr. Ahmed Barzenji. He says, hi, Professor. How do you decide which one to use in knee osteoarthritis, hyalgen or steroid injection? Uh, I think, of course, these things uh, depend on availability too. So most of the time I would probably use um, uh, steroid injection. Uh, I know the limitation of steroid. Uh, I know I tell the patient that may or may not work. And if it works, probably it will work for a month or so. Um, I think if I have a younger person with mild arthritis, I would offer hyaluronic acid injection. I wouldn't like to inject steroid into young people if I can avoid it. Having said that, there are times you know you have to because it is more effective in certain conditions, especially for a severer type of arthritis. 
Thank you, Jerry. The other question is from myself, actually. See, I've been uh, checking the data on hyaluronic acid for quite a long time. And uh, I, I see that you have also quoted the Academy's uh, 2013 guideline, which says that hyaluronic acid has no effect. And the guideline hasn't been updated till now, actually seven years ago. Right, because I, I was looking for it, I couldn't find it, and I thought I have my, might have missed it. So. No, it hasn't been updated for mm -hmm. seven years close to. So my question is, see, you be a journal editor. See, the biggest problem is when you have, say, suppose you're looking at data of, uh, say, a systematic review, and you have five RCTs uh, that say in favor of a particular, say, hyaluronic acid, and you have five RCTs that are against, so that you have a heterogeneity there. So that is when what I do is I look at the guideline, and then I, I mean, I look at what the guideline says. Now you have quoted the uh, Academy's guideline, you've quoted the Nice guideline, and also the Osteoarthritis Research International. So yeah. how do you go about interpreting the data? Uh yeah, no, I think it's a good point, actually, because, you know, the people who write those guidelines, you know, obviously some of it is from the literature, some of it's from probably local surveys and consensus uh, meetings. Uh, so, you know, the guidelines could be relied upon. Um, I think it is, um, if you have time looking through the papers again, because, you know, I have learned over the years that things can be interpreted the way you want to be interpreting them. There is a lot of that going on, unfortunately. So I have seen certain people who inter have looked at similar papers and they have come out with a different conclusion, um, which is very surprising to me. I think there is an element of bias in this and also element of understanding. If you don't understand the literature, then it's very difficult. And nowadays, a lot of people who do systematic reviews, they're not necessarily experienced people. So that might you know, lead to some mistakes. Thank you, Jari. The other question is, see, orthobiologics is a billion dollar industry. Okay, and a lot of these studies, systematic reviews, RCTs are funded by the companies. So is it possible to have a systematic review but excluding the articles that have been industry funded that is only choosing university funded or those without conflicts of interest so is it possible technically yeah yeah, yeah. you can within systematic reviews you can choose you know the level of bias on those studies you can also choose to exclude them right but that's what we are trying to do so we have looked at orthobiologics in sports medicine in, in general. And we have look, we've looked at the, the lower limb and the upper limb. And what we found that essentially there is, there is very little patchy evidence there. And you're almost tempted just to not to even write a systematic review because it's so bad. Uh, but then, you know, it is our obligation and duty to at least save people's time since we have wasted our time. So we analyze those and give you a, a, a proper conclusion. And I'm telling you the conclusion from, you know, looking at these for a long time, that the, the well done studies usually, usually show a, a, a negative effect. The bad, badly done studies are generally showing there is an effect, which is which is annoying. I'm sure there is a benefit of uh, uh, stem cells and MSCs, and you know, but we just yet to discover it. Okay, I think that that's all the questions that we have. And just a quick question before we conclude: what, Do you use uh, stero? I mean, any of these PRP for plantar fasciitis or tennis elbow? Ah, so so I think that is a different topic. So so PRP is very effective. The only place which is effective at is the uh, lateral epicondylitis, which is called something else probably now. But but that is where it is. Tennis elbow is where it is effective the most. 
And uh, we also found that uh, all these are more effective in the shoulder and the elbow rather than that. So for the lower limb, I have looked at them with the Achilles tendon too. They are not as useful, patella tendon or Achilles tendon, but for the lateral epicondylitis, because it's a different thing. It is a different pathology, I suspect. And don't you think PRP works differently at different joints and different pathologies? Must be. You know, I think the, the, the problem is which PRP are we talking about? Which system? What type? Is there a white cell with it? High fiber, low fiber, right? And, and how many spins? Um, it is what time or even the time of the day. If you take PRP from me, the time of the day would affect the quality of the harvest and, of course, age and various other things. So, so far, hasn't been any clean studies. So what we are trying to do in our center is we are first thing, we are trying to find out what is in those, what is there inside those injections we are giving. We're trying to find out, are they cells? It might be the paracrine effect uh, of the MSCs. And MSCs uh, now, you know, our listeners know they are not stem cells but they are the parasites that get activated and they are available everywhere. And they may, they may you know, secrete some growth factors, various other factors that that would be the, their effect may not be through regeneration as such, but it may be through the paracrine effect. Uh, thank you, Jerry. I think that's all the questions that we have for today's session. Thank you for the fantastic lecture and no really problem. a lot thank of insight into the evidence part. I mean, being a journal editor carries a lot more value and is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much for joining in. And thank we you. really look forward for one more from your side, one more lecture soon. No problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.